topic of today's presentation is how to set up and run a DNA project. Myself and Debbie are going to be giving the presentation, but it's very much an interactive event, so if you have questions, please just put up your hand and we'll try and ask them, answer them as we go along, because I think it's better that way and you learn more about, uh, about the topic that way. Can I just start off by asking how many people here have got a DNA project up and running? Okay, so there's only one. I'm going to count students. Yeah, 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 no, 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 two. You've got two. Don't say that out loud. Um, so there's about four people, and the rest uh, are five people with Cliff. So, that, so the rest of you won't have not started a DNA project yet, but are possibly thinking of one. Well, uh, that's great, because this talk is very much aimed at trying to get as much information about how you actually do it, what button you click, where do you move your mouse, uh, so that uh, it'll be easy for you to understand exactly what to do. And because we're recording it, and it's going to be available on the Guild video channel, you can come back to this presentation at any time and uh, just recap and refresh your mind. What did you say about that? I'll go back and look at the video. So, um, I have to point it at the computer. Before we start, it's just to say that this presentation uh, will be available as a video, but also it should be uh, taken on board in conjunction with other sources of information such as the Seven Pillars of Wisdom, which we have on sale here, uh, the Guild YouTube channel on members of sources, um, and also the ISOG wiki. So there's plenty of other sources of information available. Debbie will uh, run through some of those later on. But <clears throat> just to start off with, let's take a quick look at what we're going to cover. Um, I'll cover why I do a, a one name study DNA, DNA project in the first place, uh, also how to set up a DNA project and how to interpret and organize the results. And that will take us to about 3.30 or so, and we'll have a coffee break, and then Debbie will talk about uh, taking it a little bit further, the, the value of, of joining Hapa Group, geographical and other projects, SNP testing, upgrading your markers, uh, a little bit about marketing and recruitment, um, and publishing your results, and then uh, the various resources that are available. So it's a fairly full afternoon. There'll be a comfort break, and then if people want, we can have a dedicated Q&A session. But we have the room until 7 o'clock. We don't plan on staying there that long, uh, because I'm sure some of you have homes to go to. Um, so we'll probably need to close the meeting about 5.30, but that is all. Um, and then anybody who wants to, there's a lovely Italian restaurant down the road, so you're more than welcome to come and have dinner afterwards, and we can continue any discussions at that point in time. So, um, just to recap and take a big step back, what can you get from a DNA test? Uh, the most obvious thing is you can identify genetic cousins, and these may be either on your direct mail line, via your Y DNA, which follows the surname, and that goes back at least to the introduction of surnames, if not further. Um, on your direct female line, uh, you can connect with genetic cousins using mitochondrial DNA, and on all your lines, you can connect with genetic cousins using autosomal DNA, but the reach there is only about 200 years, or about five, six, or seven generations. Um, you can also find out your deep ancestry, the route that your ancestors took out of Africa 60,000 years ago. And some people are interested in that, and some people aren't. <coughs> Uh, not particularly relevant for a one name study, but it makes for interesting um, cocktail party discussions. Um, you can also look at your ethnic admixture, much more popular in the United States, where there is such a range of ethnic groups. Um, it can be very helpful to, to find out which of your um, family lines belong to which particular ethnic group. You can look at what percent Neanderthal you are what percent Denisovan you are, another um, ancient hominid form. Um, and again, that's coffee table uh, discussion. Uh, you can also have a medical risk assessment if you test with 23andMe. And the other thing you get from doing a DNA test is access to a community of avid genetic genealogists. And you'll find that many of them are members of the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. So that's what you can get from a DNA test. But why uh, should we do a DNA project associated with our one name studies? Well, if you're anything like me and my study, you have a whole load of branches ending in a whole load of brick walls. <laughs> so there's only so far that you can go back. And here's a map 
of my Spirit surname project. And I have 18 family branches in Ireland, 45 in the UK, 16 in Canada, 132 in America, 25 in Australia, and I haven't even tackled South America, Africa, or the rest of Europe. So um, it's, it's huge, potentially. And what DNA can do is, if this is my spear and project, and we all are related to the early humans, what it can do is, traditional genealogy has got us so, back so far, we have 236 branches, family branches in the tree. <coughs> DNA testing can help reduce that by, by linking up the branches into genetic families and reducing the number of branches that you have in your city. And ultimately, it'd be nice to connect it back to, uh, you know, connect, connect everybody back. Um, and uh, that brings us back to genetic Adam in Africa, 60,000 years ago. The other reason we're doing a one name study, and this is taken from James Irvin's uh, project, is if you're lucky enough to have a genealogy that goes all the way back to 1200, as uh, the traditional Scottish lines in the Irvin project do, then DNA can help establish the genetic signature of each of the individual lines, and it also tells new members, who may only be able to go back to, say, 1800, tells them to which line they're more, most likely to be related to. And by, by that process, people can piggyback onto somebody who has an extensive genealogy, and uh, even though they have a small genealogy, they can piggyback and go all the way back to 1200 and the uh, first use of surnames. So, <clears throat> when do you start your DNA project? As soon as possible. Your surname may be taken if you delay. Some participants may, might not be available if you wait too long. And it will take a long time, about 10 years on average, I would say. Uh, so the sooner you start, the better. Uh, as well as that, the DNA project can run in parallel to your main one name study. You don't need to have your one name study finished and then start your DNA and then go back. Uh, set it up, let it trickle on until you're ready to do some targeted work. You don't need to understand everything before you start. And anyone who has done a DNA study will know that you've learned most of your stuff along the way. So uh, don't be discouraged by not knowing everything. Start now, you will learn as you go along. Um, the first step in setting up a DNA project is to sit down with a blank piece of paper and a pen and start writing. And the first thing you think about is, why am I doing this project? And you set yourself some goals. And this is arguably the most important part of your project because if you haven't set the right goal, you'll be aiming in the wrong direction. Um, you should come back and review the goals on a regular basis and revise them as time goes on. And I use an STP approach, situation, target, proposal. Where are we now? Where do we want to be? How do we get there? Um, and you start with the background to your project, and anyone that has a one-name study on the Guild website, and how many people have a one-name study ongoing? Okay, so most people have a one-name study ongoing, so you probably will have filled in the Guild profile for your study, and that's a very good place to start with the background. So you've actually done that work already. Um, the suspected origins and evolution of your name, whether it's single or multiple, where did it start and where did it spread to, and uh, you probably ended up like me with many branches ending in brick walls. I have 236 branches all together. Uh, another piece of advice, be as specific as possible about your goals. Um, a vague goal would be to help my family history, but a more specific goal would be to identify which branches are genetically related to each other. And the typical goals of a one-name study are, again, to identify which family branches are related to each other, those that have similar genetic signatures can be grouped together and be considered to be related to each other genetically. Um, a second goal would be to confirm paper trail evidence and traditional genealogies. A third goal would be to help to focus further documentary research. Because if you know that that family branch is related to this family branch, they should be collaborating together to find out where they join up. <coughs> Um, to identify the likely origin of each genetic family. Um, to help people with the surname in question establish to which genetic family they belong 
and to piggyback onto established genealogies. So that's very much, and that's a real um, carrot to induce people to join a project. You join our projects, and you match somebody who has an established genealogy, you're immediately jumping from 1800 back to 1200. And that's a real carrot for, for, for project members. Um, the sixth, or a, rather a sixth one, would be to study the evolution of the surname and its, uh, and its various variants from the early origins to the present day form. And a very good example of that would be Susan Maith's project, and we'll talk about that in a while. And then, of course, to document and publish the results along the way so that others can derive the maximum benefit from the project. You know, if you have 100 people in the project and they've all spent $129 on a YDNA test, the more you make it available to the public, the more people will, will, will benefit from the project and will hopefully join in. So, the second step then is to decide on your surname variants. Who do you want in your project? Which variants? And it's important for knowing who to recruit. And also for any targeted work, you know, I'm going to target the Spearmans first and the Spearings. At a later stage, I'll go to the Spearmans, and then at a later stage, I might include the Spears as well, because some Spears may have been Spearmans originally. Um, so, so the project can get wider and wider and wider. Um, so it's important to decide on which variants you want and which ones you're going to start with. The third step is to determine where your project participants are likely to be living. And the answer, in many cases, is America, because so many people went over there. And we'll, we'll have a, a look at um, uh, the next slide uh, on James Irvine's project, how, how that uh, affected his particular project. But there's various surname distribution maps available <clears throat> that can give you information on, on the surname distribution and the current location of your surname and variants. Public profiler, are you all aware of that? Public profiler. Um, which, which looks at GB names and also world names. Uh, Ancestry.com have a break, and that's, this is free as well, um, have a breakdown of the US states based on the 1840 census, 1880 and 1920. They also have England and Wales based on the 1891, and they have all the Scottish censuses from 1841 to 1901, and they break down the surname distribution by county. Then, of course, we have Archer's Surname Atlas, which many of you will be familiar with, available from the Guild for about £15 pounds or so. Um, and the last one is Howard Matheson's uh, Facebook page called Surname Distribution Maps, which is a very useful uh, resource for, for those rarer maps. Um, and uh, this helps to, to tell whether you're expecting a single or a multiple origin. Now, um, this is James Irwin's, Irwin's project. The historic origin of his genetic families, and there's 300 people in this project, 84% uh, of the families historically came from Scotland, with 5% from Ireland. But of the 300 people in his project, the earliest paternal ancestor, only 24% uh, are in Scotland and 38% are in Ireland. The participant's place of residence today 78% of his participants are living in the US. So you're going to have to deal with Americans. And many of them will have a line that goes down their, their very paternal ancestor will be in the US and won't lead you back to the historic origins of your surname. Um, so that's a James project, and 61% of Irwin's living in the world today are living in the US. So most are of your project participants will be in the US. I'm going to run through these very quickly. This is just the public profiler site. You click here, and it takes, I've entered Spearin in the name, and it's quite a rare name, only in Ireland and England. We zone in on Europe. You can see it's Southeast uh, England and East Ireland. If I add a G into Spearin, everything ships over to Germany and the Netherlands. What's going on? Am I German? I couldn't have hoped for a worse outcome. <laughs> <laughs> if I add an S on the series, look what, look what happens. It all shifts around again. So this raises the question, is spearing related to spearings? And if I use the anglicized version of spear, in, then we see that it all shifts over to England, by and large, with a concentration in the southwest. Um, and 
it raises these questions about which variant is related to which other variant. Um, and if we look at the world map, we see that there's no discrimination <coughs> over in America, Canada, and the US. Which of these are related to which of the European variants? So these are all questions that uh, these, these distribution, map, distribution maps help raise. Sorry, go ahead. Can I just ask you to go back a few slides? Sure. I noticed that um, when, when you're, uh, yeah, no, that will be fine. Your concentration here is on the UK. Yes. I'm interested in the Spanish uh, branches. Yes. Yeah. Um, is, is that because of the British influence in those particular? I have no and, idea. And looking at the very south of France, could that simply be, sorry, the south of Spain, could that simply be Gibraltar? It could very well be Gibraltar, all, all on its own. And this is the problem with maps, when they just look at kind of regional level, you don't get a, 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 a kind of granular um, information from that, from that particular view. So this could all be Gibraltar, and there might be no spirits in southwest other than that, in that small concentration. In the UK, you can overcome that with Archer's Cernan Atlas, which I'll go on to actually because it's, it's, um, it breaks it down by county, but then it breaks it down further by pool law union. These are the ancestry ones. Sorry, can I sure. just interrupt? Going back to those maps again, was that 2001 or 1981 you were showing for the Europeans? Oh, those were, the, um, those were 2001. So I that believe. could actually be Brits living in Spain and France then, couldn't it? Yes. It could be actually that. Yeah. Yeah. It could, it could very well be. Um, so, you know, they tell you so much, but they, they answer some questions, but they raise more questions <laughs> than, they, than they actually answer. But it's still a very, very good... Because they're all the coast in Spain, aren't they? So, yeah, they just... <laughs> so they could very well be Brits. And, you know, I'm not going to be... If I do get somebody from um, Costa Brava saying, can I join your spirit project, please, <laughs> I will definitely let you know. But yes, you know. Well, I'm a project manager living in France in my project. Oh, do you? It's British. Okay. And does he turn up on the public profile? I'm actually going to see. So, um, yeah, so Ancestry has a similar set of maps that are free, and um, so you'll see the web address uh, up here, and you'll see it on the video. Um, and it breaks down by state, um, it uses the 1840, 1880, 1920 census. Um, similarly, in the Wales, based on the 1891 census, it's breaks down by county. Um, and then in Scotland, you've got every census from 1841 up to 1901, again breaking it down by county. But with Archer's surname atlas, and this is the county view, we have a similar distribution of spirins in the southwest, across the southwest. This is spearing, sparing, spiring, sparings, sparing, uh, spearing. You know, so all the various variations. If we go to the to this and click on Portal or Union, we see that it's broken down into much finer, granular details. So I'm looking, I'm particularly interested for one my, my women study in these areas here. So that's the Cernan Atlas, and then this is Howard Matheson's uh, Cernan Distribution Maps Facebook page. Take home message: the maps can inform you whether the Cernan origin is likely to be single or multiple. I'm suspecting a multiple origin for my various spirit and variants. Um, give you possible locations for your surname origin. Could be the UK, could be Germany. Um, and give you an idea of where present day participants are located, very largely over America. So that's step three, trying to locate where your participants are likely to come from. Step four, has your name already been taken? Um, there may be a DNA project already available for your surname, so you need to go to the FTD DNA website and check. Uh, if it hasn't been taken, then just email Family Tree DNA, ask them to set up a project. There's the, the address there. They'll send you a username and password, and you just follow the instructions to access the project administration pages. I'm going to look at that. Um, if your name has already been taken, then what are your options? Well, you could offer to collaborate with the project administrator that's already set up that certain project, or you could offer to co-administer it, or you could ask to take it over if it looks like it's a dormant project. Um, you could start a new project with a surname variant, not your first choice, maybe your second choice. And um, uh, you could ask the other project administrator to tell their members to join your project as well. Um, 
And lastly, you can ask Susan Mates. Now, Susan Mates is the Guild DNA Advisor. And she's been using DNA since 2001 and has the Mates Surname Project on Family Tree DNA, 316 members, and she's published the results in the Journal of the One Net One Net Studies. Um, and she provides free advice, guidance, and assistance to members on any aspect of a DNA project. You also can get uh, advice from the Guild of the Video channel, including these slides here. Um, the help desk at FTDNA. Also, the ISAB Wiki mailing list page, which gives you a whole list of various genealogy mailing lists. Uh, the ISAB have a specific project admins mailing list, and there's also a wide DNA project admins Facebook group as well. So there's loads of information available from these various sources. Treat. Can I just take you back one slide? Sure. <clears throat> okay, I'd like to just mention since we started up the DNA kits for the, the Guild, that I would recommend that anybody before they even start is to contact Susan Reeds and she will arrange for you to have a project. She will also, if you need to collaborate or co administer, she will do all the work for you and to make it very, very easy. And in fact, I would say that that's the best route. Yeah. For, for, for the guild members to do. Absolutely, um, and it's always nice to have somebody mentoring you all yeah. along the way. She will do that to the end of the day. And this is totally voluntary, free of charge, and she loves doing it. So Susan is a great uh, resource, um, one that everybody should take advantage of. And Susan's uh, direct email address, surprisingly, is dna at one-name.org. Step six is then to create your project profile and the website pages. And we'll look at that in a, a bit more detail, but it involves going to the FDDNA website, logging in with your admin credentials, your username and password that you got in the email from Family Tree DNA, and create your pages. And you could do that in an hour. So you could actually be up and running in an hour's time. Susan so, actually does that for you. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sure. So either Susan will do this for you, or you can do it yourself, whichever you prefer. Um, and then once that's up and running, you're ready to start testing people. So those are seven simple steps to actually starting your own DNA project. Uh, if you're going to test people, take the test yourself and see what it's like. Um, if you're a woman, then you turn to the, your favorite Y-DNA containing person in the world and ask them to help you out. Um, uh, but you should test yourself also, if people are collaborating with you on your, on your surname project or family tree, get them to test as well. Um, if you want to do some targeted testing, then probably your first priority is those family branches with very few surviving males, very few surviving Y-DNA lines. Get them to join while they are still there. Um, and then you can just open it up to complete strangers, anybody and everybody. Um, allocating, well, just, just limiting it to those variants that you want to start off with. Um, we have guild kits available for £80, but there's also family tree DNA sales, which are great for Christmas and birthday presents. Um, and be prepared to fork out money from your own pocket as well, because a lot of the time um, you really want to get somebody to test from a particularly rare line, and they're the last person, and they're very reluctant, and you say, look, I'll pay for the test myself. And they're still reluctant, but you manage to twist them on, and they do it. So, Teresa. Sorry about this. Just to plug it, I've got them here. Don't yep. want to do anything else. Just give me the eight of hand. <laughs> <laughs> very simple, very direct. Uh, in terms of persuading people to do it, yeah. are, you, are we going to move on to that? Because that's we, the thing that I'm incredibly hesitant about in terms of. Because mm. I'm just expecting people to be very suspicious of my request to test their DNA and what it's sure. all about, including my own father. <laughs> I think we'll, 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 we'll chat about that later on. It'll, it'll okay. come up in, in okay. part of the marketing yeah. and okay. recruitment and techniques that can be used. Um, so those are the seven simple steps to setting up the project. Um, I'm just going to whisk you through some of the things that you can do. Now Susan can do all of this for you, but I think it's useful to know what Susan is doing so that you're relatively familiar with it yourself. First thing to see to do is check to see if your name is taken or not. And this is where you go, you log on to the Family Tree DNA website, you enter your name here in the search box, and if I enter it in Spearing, then the surname search results come up 
that there are six spearmans in the family tree database. The certain project results come up, and yes, uh, there are these, some of these spearmans are in the spearman surname project, and that's my project. You can see the guild logo there, and there's also a spearman project. Um, the reason why there's a discrepancy between 34 members here of the Spirit and Surname Project and only six Spirits is, of course, because of variants. Not everybody in the Spirit Project would be called Spirit, there's Spearings, Sparings, that type of thing. So that's why you get a discrepancy between the number of surname research results and the number of members in the project. It's also worth saying that the numbers there are not just males, it's males and females. So you'll get some females who've taken family finding mitochondrial DNA testing. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so would you have to sure. merge it in variants? Um, you, you, well, I'll, sh I'll come on to that actually because I'll show you uh, when we're creating the project profile. It's not so much registering them as just letting people know what variants you're looking for. But we'll see that when we come to look at the project profile page. Um, and here is the project profile page. If I just go back one, if I click on this, Spirit Surname Project, it takes me to the project profile page. And this is just a summary, a brief overview of the project. You've got the, um, the member count. Here's a link to the actual website itself, and we'll see how we build our websites. There's an email for the administrator, that's myself. Um, and then there's a description. And if we blow up the description, it's just a very brief overview of the project. This project aims to establish the relationship between different people whose family name is Spirit or one of its very many variants. We have documentary evidence, blah, 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 blah. So it's just a couple of lines to introduce people to what the project is about. This paragraph is, is generated by a family tree DNA and just uh, states that the requirements are a male with Y DNA. And then the surnames in the project, I've just listed all of my Spirit variants here. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, then, if we click on the project website link, it takes us to the project website home page. And um, there are three main groups of pages up here. If I blow this up, there's the about pages, the results pages, and the join request. Now, the about pages are the background to the project, the goals of the project, the news or any updates relating to the project, and your interpretation of the results. These are the pages that you will design yourself. These ones here, the Y-DNA results pages, are generated automatically by Family Tree DNA, but you will manipulate how that data is presented you, by simply grouping the project members into the various genetic families that they belong to. So we'll look at that as well. And then the Join Request page, it simply comes up uh, with a option A, if you've already taken the test, put in your kit number, your password, and just join the project that way. Or if you're a new member, go for option B, and you purchase the test to join this project. So any new members that you want to recruit, you'll be given them the link to this specific join request page. They click on that, and they can buy a test kit for $129. Um, or if they get it from the uh, guild, then they would send it off and then go in here and enter the kit number and the password that they would be uh, given in relation to that specific kit and they would just join it using option A. So that's the project website home page. Now, in terms of the structure of your DNA project and the DNA project website, it's just like a TV. And this is just a simple way of visualizing what your project structures would look like. Now, you have the public pages of your project website. These are the pages that everybody can see, and the general public can see it. Anybody can log on to Family Tree DNA, and they'll be able to see the front pages of your project, the public pages. But behind every television, there is, uh, well, and we've seen that the, the public pages are the about pages, background, goals, news, and interpretation of results, uh, the results pages, and the join request. But we also have behind the television the internal workings, the cathode ray tube, the capacitors, the transistors, the carburetor. And um, this is where you will be sitting 
And I used an old-fashioned television because flat screens are so cramped, it's very difficult to sit inside them. Um, but you've got much more room here in these type of old televisions. And this is where you will be controlling all of the um, internal workings so as to create general public pages. And then feeding in to the television are all the private member pages from all the members of your project. Tom, Dick and Harry, Huey, Dewey and Louie, Rita, Sue and Bob too, Anthony and Cleopatra, and of course, you yourself. So all of your project members will feed in to the admin. You will manipulate these pages and create something for the public to see, whilst preserving the privacy of the members of your project. Now, um, we've looked at the public pages. I want to now just take a quick look at the admin pages, and specifically, um, I want to look at project administration pages. But there are four groups of pages under the admin pages. Uh, the member reports are, tell you all about how many members are in your project and give you access to each of the private pages of each of your members. So as project administrator, you will be able to access all the private information of all your project members. Um, the genetic reports give you um, the actual data, but also allow you to manipulate that data, so we'll be looking at those. And then the project admin pages um, allow you to design the website, but also to um, put your group members in different projects. So we're going to look at all of that. Um, and then the My Account has your uh, password, you can change the password, it has your contact details, etc. Can they also get hold of each other's no, details? No, everybody's oh, yeah. private page is private to them. You, as the admin, are the only person, apart from the individual, who has access to their own private information. So there's a lot of responsibility as administrator to make sure that the privacy of your members is actually maintained. Now, um, if we go to the family tree DNA login page and enter our username and password, uh, this will take us to the project admin pages. Okay, so this is your admin password that you've been sent by Family Tree DNA. And here, um, I'm just going to start off by looking at the project administration pages, and specifically at project profile. Now, when you do set up your project, the best way of familiarizing yourself with all of these pages is to go through each of them and just click on them, see what they do, have a play around. But, so we're going to look at just those pages that will help you get your project up and running. So the project profile, which is the overview of your project, um, it'll, if you click on that, it takes you into the, this, first of all, this page which has a description of the project, and we've seen this already. This project aims to establish the relationship between different people whose family name is Spiron, etc., etc. You can write whatever you want in here, just giving, a, giving an overview of your project. Then it automatically generates your website name, um, and uh, you can also put your variants in here. So whatever variants you want in the project, you just put them in here, under the surnames uh, box. Then you click on Save Project Profile, and your project profile is done. Susan will do all this for you, but it's useful to know, in case you want to change anything, how to get in there yourself. So that was relatively simple, that's your project profile. Let's go back to your administration pages and the project administration pages. Let's go down to the public website. And if we click on that, it takes us to a site called Configuration page. And if we're talking about my DNA, I just tick these three boxes. It also gives you the option of how you want to display your members in the public domain. And I click on Members' Last Name and Most Distant Ancestor. So that still preserves, preserves their privacy. And you've got options for embedding the results in your own personal website if you have one that's completely separate to family to DNA. Um, in the background, you can just copy your guild page if you like and just you know, put a brief summary in there. Under goals, uh, you see that I've just copied and pasted from the, the typical goals of one name study from that earlier slide. Here you would put any news and updates, and I've just put a link to um, the dedicated website for the project, but you know, it's entirely up to you what you want to do with it. And as far as interpretation of the results is concerned, 
There's a whole section on our dedicated website that talks about interpretation of the results. So I've just put the links to the website in there so people can just link to it directly. After you've done all that, your project website is done. You've designed all of the about pages and all the information that people will need to know to know what the project is about. You are now ready to start recruiting patients. Um, so, participants. You can tell what my background is. So, participants, yes. Um, so, to recap then, you've set your goals, you've decided on your variants, you've located your participants. Um, you've, you've found out whether your name has been taken already, you've got the support of Susan behind you and all the various other online resources, uh, you've created your project profile and your website pages, you are now ready to start recruiting to your project. Cool. Setup complete. And if you want, Susan will help you do all of that. So relatively straightforward.